Hi, I'm Dr. Bill McIver. I'm a professor of anesthesiology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine and a staff anesthesiologist at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. This video series was created to introduce you to the concepts underlying comprehensive hemodynamic monitoring. In the last presentation, we learned that blood pressure is a complex parameter that is relatively easy to measure, but doesn't always reflect the flow to the tissues. We were reminded that blood pressure is the product of cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. In this presentation, we'll consider the flow parameters that underlie blood pressure to get a more complete and comprehensive assessment of hemodynamics. Now, let's look at the determinants of cardiac output. Here's a simplified diagram of the left ventricle. Let's measure the flow coming out of it. The heart beats a certain number of times per minute, and each beat ejects a volume of blood called the stroke volume. The product of stroke volume and heart rate gives us the volume pumped per minute time or the cardiac output. The diagram illustrates this. Let's start by considering heart rate's effect on cardiac output. As this diagram shows, very slow and very fast heart rates can negatively impact cardiac output. Heart rates between 50 to 110 beats per minute do not usually produce low cardiac output states. Heart rhythm is also important to cardiac output. Atrial fibrillation, for example, can impact the volume due to the loss of atrial contraction. Now let's look at stroke volume, which has three determinants, preload, afterload, and contractility. Preload is the amount of stretch on the left ventricle prior to contraction. One important factor that contributes to that stretch is the volume inside the ventricle. The relationship between preload and stroke volume is called the Frank-Starling curve. The x-axis represents the preload, the volume in the ventricle at the end of diastole. The y-axis represents the volume ejected by the left ventricle with each beat. The Frank-Starling principle illustrates the heart's ability to increase stroke volume in response to an increase in preload. Here we're starting out with a normally filled left ventricle. The ventricle is generating a stroke volume of 70 milliliters per beat. When we decrease volume in the ventricle, the preload and often the stroke volume decreases. The systemic vascular resistance may increase some in response to the decreased cardiac output and the blood pressure therefore may stay relatively constant. Now let's return to normal and add more fluid to the ventricle. The goal of giving fluid to a patient is to increase preload and therefore stroke volume. It's important to make sure that the fluid you gave had its intended effect. If you gave a fluid bolus, and the stroke volume increased by more than 10%, the patient was fluid responsive and may still be on the steep part of the Frank-Starling curve. If the patient's stroke volume did not increase by 10% with the fluid bolus, they were on the flat part of the Frank-Starling curve and were not, as we say, fluid responsive. Continuing to give fluid to patients who are not fluid responsive can push them to the far side of their Frank-Starling curve and ultimately contribute to heart failure. Afterload also affects stroke volume. Afterload is the force the ventricle must come to open the aortic valve to eject blood. It is determined by resistance in the blood vessels, viscosity of the blood, and the pliability of the aortic valve, among other things. Back to our diagram, starting in the normal state. As we increase the afterload, the left ventricle must work harder to eject blood. Stroke volume, therefore, could decrease. In the diagram, as afterload increases, you can see the left ventricle getting bigger. While the stroke volume and cardiac output decrease, the blood pressure, however, may remain normal. Remember in the first lesson, we learned that a normal blood pressure can exist during a low flow, high resistance state. Now let's go from normal to low afterload on the left ventricle. See that the ventricle is ejecting more blood with each contraction? The stroke volume and cardiac output are increasing, but a high output and low resistance could result in normal blood pressure. Last one, contractility. Contractility is the force the ventricle generates during contraction. Drugs like beta-1 agonists, antagonists, or phosphodiesterase inhibitors are commonly used to increase or decrease contractility. In our diagram, let's represent contractility with arrows inside of the myocardium. You can see that as we increase contractility, the ventricle generates more force. The stroke volume, cardiac output, DPDT and ejection fraction increase. 
if the SVR is not affected, an increase in contractility could result in an increase in blood pressure. Now let's decrease contractility. See that the stroke volume, cardiac output, DPDT, and ejection fraction are all decreasing. Remember, blood pressure equals cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. As we previously mentioned, if cardiac output changes, for whatever reason discussed in this video, the SVR may change substantially to compensate. That's why simply measuring blood pressure can make it very difficult to interpret a patient's true hemodynamic state. While the examples in this lesson focus on normal physiology, it is important to recognize that things like anesthesia, medications, or sepsis may affect a patient's physiologic response, which makes measuring the determinants of blood pressure and cardiac outputs even more important. If you've understood this lesson, you can explain the effects of heart rate and stroke volume on cardiac output, effects of preload, afterload, and contractility on stroke volume, and that blood pressure may or may not reflect critical changes in hemodynamics. Tune into the next Critical Insights video, where we will continue our conversation on advanced hemodynamic monitoring. Like this video and subscribe to stay up to date on the Critical Insights series, symposium recordings, and other educational videos. You can also visit edwards.com slash clinical education for in-depth resources and educational tools to help you solve the clinical challenges facing you today and in the future.